Hi again. Uh, wow, this is now my pleasure to welcome Chantelle Dubois. She is an avionics and software systems engineer at the Canadian Space Agency. Welcome, Chantelle. Uh, she works for the Lunar Gateway Program, facilitating the delivery of the Canada Arm 3, which is the robotic arm of the station. Uh, it, she also supports the Lunar Exploration Acceleration Program, providing insight and support for robotic software. We all know that space is a particularly constrained environment for embedding AI in software and software in general. And Chantal will talk about artificial intelligence advancing the future of space exploration and its use. Chantal, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Gregory. I was so excited to start talking. So my apologies for talking over you. Um, yeah, so my name is Chantal and I've been supporting the Lunar Gateway Program at the Canadian Space Agency for the last couple of years. Um, and my role specifically is as an avionics and software systems engineer. So in my presentation, I'm gonna talk a little bit, I'm gonna focus more on how AI is envisioned to play a role in the Canada Arm 3 project. And at the end, I'll go over some other areas that we're identifying AI and autonomy as being really important and applicable. So to kind of set the groundwork for what Canada Arm 3 is, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the family portrait of the Canada Arm uh, robotic systems. So in 1981, Canadarm1 was uh, deployed, and this was a robotic arm that was deployed on the space shuttle program. So this arm was mostly crew controlled. It wasn't autonomous in any sense, um, and it operated until 2011. In 2011, we then deployed Canadarm2 on the International Space Station, and it still operates today. Unlike Canadarm1, Canarm2 is ground operable and also operable by crew members on board the station. I always like to share this photo when talking about the Canada Arms just because I think it's really interesting. As you see that there's a 10, 10 year overlay in when Canada Arm 1 and Canada Arm 2 were in operation. And so there was opportunities for them to work together. And in this image, you'll see that Canada Arm 2 is handing over a metal pallet to Canada Arm 1 for loading into the space shuttle cargo bay. And during this operation, Chris Hadfield, one of Canada's most well-known astronauts, was controlling Canada Arm 1 from within the space shuttle. What's coming next is Canada Arm 3. So this is going to be the next generation of robotic uh, manipulators that will then be deployed on the Lunar Space Station. So this arm we envision as being two parts. There's going to be the Exploration Dexterous Arm, which is going to be a smaller robotic arm that will function to provide maintenance to the larger arm um, and also assist in some tasks. And then the ex exploration large arm will be the main arm, the large arm of the robotic system. They'll be doing most of the other work. So configuring the gateway, uh, capturing objects and um, moving tools from one position to another. Canada Arm 3 will be a little bit more capable than Canada Arm 2 and Canada Arm 1. So Canada Arm 2 and Canada Arm 1 had some basic functions like force moment sensors. Uh, Canada Arm 2 introduced some collision avoidance detection. So setting off alarms when there's a singularity being approached or collision being approached. And Canada Arm 3, we, we believe will have more capabilities in the sense of it'll probably be aware of its environment with 3D visual, visual sensing. One of the main differences with Canada Arm 3, though, is that it'll also be nominally autonomous in nature. That is, we, in the long term, we want to be fully autonomously operated and crew and ground will only intervene when it's necessary. The launch of Canada Arm 3 is expected in 2026 and it's being planned for a 15 year lifetime. Some more groundwork I want to set is what is the Lunar Gateway? Uh, so Lunar Gateway will be a science outpost that will orbit the moon. So very similar to the ISS, although about one sixth of the size. Currently, it's a NASA-led project. CSA is contributing with the Canada Arm 3, uh, but we also have participation from the European Space Agency and the Japanese Space Agency, JAXA, uh, and they'll be providing um, a lunar, or habitable module. So why are we doing this? Why are we putting a space station around the moon? Well, Canada is one of the participants of the Global Exploration Roadmap in which several space agencies from around the world are collaborating together uh, to work towards the, the goal of eventually putting humans on Mars. 
And so on the way to that plan, on the way to getting humans on Mars, it's been identified that returning to the moon is a big part of this. So that means going back to the moon uh, by putting a space station in orbit around it um, and using that as a platform to further analyze and um, understand the deep space environment, especially as it, as it has an impact on the human body. Um, it, a part of this is also surface operations on the lunar surface. So exploring more of the surface and do more technology demonstration to prove our capability to eventually go to Mars. So that's in the more near term, uh, in the 2020s, and then hopefully in the 2030s, 2040s, Mars can be the next step. So where is the Lunar Gateway going to go? It's going to be around the moon, but it's going to be in a near to linear halo orbit. And this orbit's a little bit unusual as it is highly elliptical, as you'll see here. At the closest point to the surface, it'll be about 3,000 kilometers above the surface. And from the furthest point, it'll be about 70,000 kilometers from the surface. And it'll take one full week or seven days to orbit the entire uh, moon. This is a really interesting orbit because it's going to be, um, it presents a really interesting point for performing science. Uh, it also provides better communication with the Earth. It'll also be a good opportunity for uh, surface operations. So being able to deploy things when it's close, being able to communicate when it's further away. Um, it's also an environment that's more representative of the deep space environment, which is of very high importance when we're talking about sending people to Mars. And then when is this gateway going to be launched? Well, the initial phase is planned for 2024. And this is part of NASA's efforts of boots on the moon. So that's putting humans back on the moon for the first time since the Apollo missions. During this initial phase, only the most essential modules of the Lunar Gateway Station will be sent up. So this includes the power and propulsion elements, the habitable module called HALO, the lunar module, and the human landing system, which will take astronauts to the surface. In 2026 is approximately when we'll have the sustaining phase. So this is gonna be where we expand the utilization and capacity of the gateway. And part of this phase will be the Canon Arm 3, in addition to another habitable module and the airlock. So just a note, Canon Arm 3 is currently in phase A, so we're still very early in the development of the system. So one of the interesting things about the Lunar Gateway is that unlike the International Space Station, it won't be um, habit habitated by humans all year round. So ISS has had human crew on it nearly continuously for the last decade and a half. Uh, the Lunar Gateway will not be quite that way. So we're envisioning that Lunar Gateway will only be habitable, habitated by humans about one month out of the entire year. And so the space station around the moon, the Lunar Gateway, will be mostly uninhabited habited, and will need to be autonomous in order to, to maintain itself. Um, and then also since crew members aren't going to be on the station very often, we want to make sure that when they are there, they're using their time as best as they can. So this is why autonomy has become sort of a mission level requirement of the Lunar Gateway. We want to optimize how crew time is spent. We want to increase independence from the ground because this is also a proving, a proving a system to prove our capability of sending a similar system to Mars and not having that real time uh, relay to the, the Earth. And so that makes it a proof of concept for deep space missions. So overall, when we put into words, the space station is gonna be something that is self-reliant. It's gonna be responsive. It's gonna be dependable. It's gonna be safe. And it'll let crew focus valuable time on science. Now, if I left you here just telling you, we're gonna make a space station, it's gonna be autonomous. It's gonna have AI involved. You might think about a movie where there was an AI on the station, um, but this isn't what's going on. We're not building HAL 9000. It's a little bit uh, more pragmatic than that. So for the purpose of the gateway program at the CSA, we had to define autonomy and AI. I'd like to point out that there, we are aware that there is a lot of debate on the exact definitions of both autonomy and AI, especially in the academic community. But for the functional purpose of this program, this is how we've defined it. So for autonomous, we define this as an execution of a task without human intervention or supervision. And for artificial intelligence, we defined it as algorithms that mimic human cognition, in particular, perception, reasoning, learning, planning, and decision-making. With this, 
uh, definition, it sort of leaves the door open for how we apply AI and what flavors of AI we use. It's also worth kind of going deeper into how we define autonomy. So autonomous functions will be the high level decision making functions in the system. And this is the type of autonomy we'll be discussing. For autonomic reflexes, these are like feedback control and control loops. This is not part of the autonomy that we're talking about. This is just classical robotic uh, techniques. And I'm also going to go over some of the stakeholders for the purpose of this presentation when talking about Canada Arm 3. We're mostly focusing on the on orbit space asset, that's the Lunar Gateway Station, the manipulator itself, that's Canada Arm 3, the operators, which is the ground segment personnel, and the astronauts, which will be the on orbit personnel. But in addition, in the broader scope of the Lunar Gateway program, there's also exploratory assets and scientists and data end users that are part of this overall stakeholder map. All right, so how do we see AI's role in autonomy in terms of how it will support Counter M3 and the Lunar Gateway missions? Well, one of the most well recognized way of looking at increasing autonomy is looking at how automated driving looks at this. So at level zero, you have zero automation in your vehicle. That is, the human driver is doing the controlling, the percepting, and the decision making. And then we increase that all the way up to level five, where the system, the vehicle, is completely autonomous. Humans don't need to be involved in any of the perception, the decision making, um, or the reflexes. You can just open up your newspaper, read, and the car will go to where it needs to be. For the purpose of Canada M3, which is a space system, we approach it more as a mixed initiative. We don't ever really want it to be completely out of control of humans. So we sort of rename these steps and I'll go into the details about what each step is. So level zero would be the manual control of the robotic system. This would be entirely crew and ground operated. And this mode isn't normally used even for Canada Arm 2 right now because it's very tedious, it's very low level, um, but it would be used for very specific and very special operations that would require that level of control. For Canada Arm 2, the perception that's available is camera views, 3D models, and moment force sensors that advise the operator of what's going on. The reasoning, though, is done at the operator level. They're assessing the situation based on available data, and they're interpreting the data themselves. The operator is also making the low-level decisions on actions at the, at the level of joint actuation and that sort of thing. Level one is validation. And this is mostly where Counter-Arm 2 is at. And this is also where we see Counter-Arm 3 starting when it's deployed. Additionally, this is also the mode most likely to be used during special operations where we need low level control of the system, but not too low. Here, perception is mostly the same, camera views, 3D models, and moment force sensors. But here, we introduce a little bit more of the mixed initiative at the reasoning level. So operators are evaluating the situation based on available data but some of that data might be interpreted, interpreted for the operator by the system. The operator at this point is still making the decisions. They're making decisions about the actions, but the system will notify the operator of any potential errors or dangers. So like I said, on counter M2, it will um, give the operator alerts about singularities or collisions. At level two, this is more collaboration. And here we might introduce higher levels of perception, such as 3D scanning or sensing. On this image on the right, uh, this is just an example, but an example of this 3D scanning and sensing is LIDAR. So just taking a LIDAR scan of the environment and having a 3D map of what's around it. Here, the reasoning is done still by the operator, but the system is interpreting more of that data to the operator. At this point, we might start introducing an autonomy architecture where the operator is making a decision at a higher level, but then that decision is being percolated down more autonomously. So here, decision making, the operator makes high level decisions about actions. The system may make lower level decisions on how to achieve them. And this might look like something like path planning. So telling the arm end effector to go from one point to another, and then the arm is gonna decide how it's articulating to get to that point. Level three is recommendation. And I would say that this is the near-term goal of Canada Arm 3. And this would be the opportunity to gain confidence in our autonomous functions. Here, perception is enhanced a little bit more. We're doing 
At this point, we would want to be doing more complete localized environment sensing in 2D and 3D in models and in collision detection. Here, the system is going to be doing more of the reasoning. It's going to be interpreting the situation, and then it'll provide the operator a selection of actions to take that it recommends. However, the operator is still ultimately making the decisions. Additionally, at this point, to support this level of reasoning, more complex onboard capabilities to process information would need to be available. Level four is operator supervision. So in addition to the perception that we would have for the last level, we would probably also start introducing edge processing and sensing. And that's to increase the time that something is seen or sensed and the system is interpreting that information. Here, the reasoning is the system is interpreting the situation alone and the processing is more contained on the space segment. There is a reduction in its reliance on the ground segment. In terms of decision-making, the system is making decisions about actions to take in response to the situations around it, but there'll be pause points so that operators can intervene if they decide they want to change the next step. So the operator at this point is observing, they're capable of intervening at any time, but specifically the pause points are meant to be sort of the point that they would intervene if necessary. And then finally, level five, fully autonomous. So this is the long-term goal for Canada M3 and one that we don't see happening in the next year or so once it's deployed, it would be something that we have to work up towards. So once again, it's the same level of perception as the last level. And here the system is interpreting the situation alone. The processing is contained on the space segment, so it's completely independent from the ground segment. The system at this point will make decisions on its own, so it's making decisions continuously and even when there's a loss of signal from the ground. I think the one big difference though from I think some of the visions of, for example, automated driving is that the operator can still intervene at any point, including at this level, if they choose to do so. So that kind of gives you a picture of what we envision for Canada Arm 3. And I think to spell some of the misconceptions when we talk about Canada Arm 3 being AI enabled, all these functions will be supported by different flavors of AI but we plan to do it in a very step-by-step -step way to prove the system, to make sure it's safe, and to improve the functionality of the Canada Arm 3 system. Some related activities I want to also mention that happen at CSA that either directly or indirectly support the Canada Arm 3 program. Um, the first one I'll start with is the MSS application computer. So this is a computer being used in conjunction with the Canada, Canada Arm 2 system. So this is a computer that can produce and read human readable script um, and perform some vision guidance uh, applications. So there's a vision guidance system with pose estimation. Uh, it performs a scripted task. And then the operators are involved and provide authorization in between motions. Another activity at the CSA is the system of autonomous planning and intelligent execution technologies, otherwise known as sapient. So this is more of like a breadboarding um, system and it's at TRL level four. And what you see here is a system where we can give it a high level task. So here it says birth ORU one to gateway ORU interface four. So it's taking one object from one point and then moving it to another point. And that's how it's being explained to the system. The system then breaks down that task into lower level tasks. And then you'll see here, it creates a timeline of each individual task and when it will be completed. The system is also meant to repair a task if something changes, if it needs to go back and redo something. It's supposed to be responsive to the actual, um, to the actual actions being taken. So this is something that I think is really interesting and is a big part of the counter uh, progress. Another activity loosely related is anomalous behavior detection spacecraft. So for the spacecraft that the Canadian Space Agency um, manages, there's quite a number of them and each one is coming or each one is producing increasingly complex sets of telemetry data, which need to be analyzed by our ground operators. Um, and for the gateway, we're also expecting this to be a thing as well, where there's gonna be tons of data generated and sometimes making sense of it is gonna be difficult. 
So for this particular project, and this is one being managed by my colleague, Henry Liu, um, he's gonna be modeling nominal system behavior of spacecraft. So something like a satellite. And when, when in the future, after this modeling is completed, when the spacecraft starts producing telemetry that's creating a model of behavior that's off-nominal, then it'll be able to inform operators of that off-nominal behavior and prepare them for uh, correcting that anomaly. So this is addressing challenges in managing the overwhelming volumes of complex telemetry data and the increasing number of space assets that we have to monitor. Another activity is the pose estimation of targets using non-ideal camera views. So this is envisioned to be a system where if, a, if an ideal camera view is not available, so something that is orthogonal to the target or has a very clear direct view of the target, if that view isn't available, operators have to use non-ideal uh, viewing camera views to try to estimate the exact location of a target. And this is very difficult to do for operators. So the system will be able to use the non-ideal views and then create a pose estimation of that target and hopefully improve performance over a human operator. Now, there's systems engineering challenges when trying to introduce autonomy and AI into a system, especially in the space sector. So in terms of safety, most AI applications or most AI algorithms are non-deterministic. We need, in, in the space sector, we need it to be deterministic. We need to know when it's gonna to come to a decision and how it comes to a decision. So this is already sort of an interesting uh, obstacle for us to deal with. Certifying AI-driven safety critical systems is also a new area for most of us. So we're looking at a crawl, walk, run approach. So introducing a more automated system supported by AI, but doing so in conjunction with an already existing system that isn't AI enabled. And then just seeing at the same time how they're both performing. At this point, the AI system won't be actually making decisions or taking actions. It's just producing an output that we then analyze. For the walking point, we would start kind of combining the two and testing more of the output of the automated system against the non-automated system. And then proving that it's performing the same. And then run is when we finally decide we're going to go with the AI system or the automated system and we're gonna start using that one nominally. Another thing to look at is black box approaches. So that is bounding behavior of our AI powered systems, making them so that they're only doing one specific task and then having well-defined input and output. And that way we can better understand if it's behaving the way we expect it to. Additionally, we need to prove that there's a net gain in safety and functionality. So we don't wanna be introducing AI or autonomy where it's not needed or where it's not actually providing this net gain. Configuration management is also a new area for these sort of AI systems. So doing data management of, or configuration management of data and metadata. And then recertifying a system when new data is used to train it because training is not likely to be a one-time activity. And the system does fundamentally change when you change the data that's trained with. Verification and validation is also an interesting topic because for the space environment, especially for something that isn't built yet, there isn't a lot of data already to use. So accessing relevant training and validation data is something that we need to consider. And then finally, training and computational resources. It's not realistic for us to expect that we'll be able to train the system on orbit. It's simply not safe, it's expensive, um, and it's very limited in terms of power and computing resources. So we envision that the models will be trained on the ground and then that model will be uploaded to the space segment. So in summary, CanArm3 is one of, one of the examples of where AI can be applied. It's autonomous operations as a mission objective of the gateway program. And likely the autonomy functions will be supported by AI. AI's applicability is being recognized for other space applications. So here I just mentioned things related to robotics or spacecraft, but this isn't just CanArm3 robotics. Earth observation and data analytics at the space agency are also using AI in some flavor. And of course, introducing AI will create novel systems engineering challenges in the space domain that we're currently exploring. And that's it for my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Chantal, for this very interesting presentation.
we have only a few minutes for questions, but uh, we can we can ask them. Uh, may I just start with one question regarding acquisition of data? Uh, and typically for the lunar case, uh, how do you plan to acquire the, 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 necess the necessary data that will be needed for uh, for learning? Uh, do you have some kind of ramp up of uh, autonomy functions uh, when the robots or the cameras or all the sensors will be uh, around the, the, the moon? Or do you buy also on uh, simulation? So what I imagine and what sort of has been in discussion is that we have CounterM2, which has quite a bit of data available since it's been in operation since 2001. Um, so that's sort of like the closest sort of data set we have before we actually build the space station around the moon. So likely we start with using that data set where possible. Um, and then when we train sort of like specific subsystems, just trying to find the very specific situations that aren't so influenced by the fact that it's not data coming from around the moon. Um, so starting from there, that's probably the data set we'd use. And then since this is sort of like a ramp up approach, we're starting at very low levels of autonomy. Um, we'll have time to collect data while we're doing non-autonomous operations on the Lunar Gateway. And then we can start using that data for the more complex uh, training that we'll have to do later on. Okay, thank you. I, I get there are a lot of specificities uh, of Im imagery in space uh, mm -hmm. re regarding the absence of atmosphere and uh, the level mm -hmm. of uh, you know, illuminations and so on. Uh, another question, uh, about, about uh, embed, uh, embedding constraints, uh, can, can you elaborate, elaborate a little bit on what are the constraints? I, I understood from one of your slides that relearning re from space uh, is, is absolutely not uh, envisaged, of course, but uh, even, even for uh, already learned models, mm -hmm. uh, any constraints that you foresee for uh, uh, putting this kind of model of neural network, for example, uh, a predefined neural network on, on board? Yeah, I guess, you know, we're at the point where we're trying to sort of make sure that we have all the hooks in place for when we want to introduce like these models that do require a little bit more processing power. So we sort of have to make really careful decisions at the beginning about what kind of computational resources are available on board. But of course, one of the challenges with the space sector is that many of the computational systems that we have on the earth, you know, we have a certain level of technology readiness on the earth that is not simply the same case for the space environment in terms of there's not like a lot of computational platforms that are validated for the managing the radiation, the power consumption. Um, those are the limitations we sort of are, are working with for the computation on board. So, so yeah, it's, it's really hard to introduce, you know, a brand new processing card, for example, into the space environment that's never been used in the space environment. It takes also quite a bit of um, slow validation that that system will work as intended as well, just simply because the space environment is gonna introduce a bunch of new problems that are more hardware specific. So things like bit flips um, or degradation of the performance. And when we're kind of combining these two sort of challenges, so the challenge of having competing platforms on orbit that are you know, trying to manage surviving in the space environment, but also introducing something that's complex in terms of software and computation. Um, those are two problems that, you know, have a little bit of synergy that we need to carefully work through. So we try to, we're trying to predict as best as we can what we need on board and then try to, yeah, I think that would be it. We, we try to plan as carefully as we can so that when we're designing the system, it has a computational capacity uh, for eventual deployment of something complex like a neural network. Yeah, thank you. And one very short and last question uh, mm -hmm. from Christopher. Are you aware of uh, of teams working on humanoid robots? Uh, I guess if I understand correctly the question uh, on the surface of the of the planets, uh, some, some kind of replacement of rovers uh, by humanoids or uh, walking walking uh, you, uh, robots, I would, I would say. Oh, wow. Um, that'd be really cool. I don't think I've heard of anything quite like that yet. Um, but I think that would be really interesting. And I think that's a, definitely a 
a new set of challenges because with our classical rovers with the wheels, you know, there's already challenges in making sure it's uh, performing the correct tear mechanics. And then with the bipedal robotics, I think that introduces a whole set of problems that are totally different, um, but I have not heard of anything like that yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Sandel. I think the, we, are, we are closing the session right now. Thanks, thanks again for your interest in presentation and questions. Mm -hmm. uh, see, you, see you very soon. Bye-bye. My pleasure. Thank you.